What's up, mi gente? Are you looking for mentorship and the place to secure the big bag? Have you ever watched me here on the Banking on Cultura podcast and thought to yourself, you know what? I want to work with Victoria Jen. Or maybe you thought to yourself, I want to be a part of her network of badass women and entrepreneurs. Well, guess what? You absolutely can. Join me this November, November 15th through the 16th in the heart of New York City for my seventh annual Secure the Big Bag and Wellness Summit. Let's face it. So many of us are tired, burnt out, ready to throw in the towel, honey. And quite frankly, we want to dedicate ourselves to the soft life. But what if there was a way for us to achieve both time and financial freedom and also have a healthy, well-balanced life? What if you could secure the big bag, build a business that fuels you versus drains you, as well as build a solid network of business besties who want to support and motivate you while also centering self? This summit is the premier destination for the latest marketing, sales, and AI tools that can 10x your business while also nurturing your well-being. Learn from top experts from both business and wellness, including executives from the corporate sector, so that you can explore corporate-level opportunities that can elevate your business to new heights. Ensuring you're not just prepared, but fully equipped to dominate in 2025 and beyond. This is your opportunity for your business to thrive while you do too. Head over to securethebigbag.com to check out the agenda and all the heavy hitters that will be in the building. I cannot wait to see you in New York City, mi gente. It's go time. Hola, mi gente. This is Audrey Puente. I'm a television meteorologist here in New York City, and I just finished an amazing podcast. It's Banking on Cultura with Victoria Jen Rodriguez, who, by the way, fabulous interviewer. She was able to pull some things out of me that um, I've never talked about before. So if you're looking to find out stuff no one's heard before, check out the podcast. It's a good one. I will pay to take you to a series of conferences of things that you are passionate about because I learned more at conferences than I ever did in the classroom. Did you ever feel like pressure to be amazing and to mm-hmm. do amazing things? My father was Tito Puente, mm-hmm. a Latin jazz the artist. Tito right. Puente. Yeah. Put some respect on that man's name. Thank you very much. <laughs> I felt like I did the work and I earned the spot. That was on the money. I Thank mean, you. every single thing. I was like, yep. Yep, I would say Oh my God, way. Audrey Puente yes. is the listener of Big yeah. Cultura. Like I can't, and she's a guest now. Okay, sorry. I had to pop in a few. In lo- I, had get, I had to get a few, uh, a few episodes in. I was like, let me see what's going on over here. Yeah, I love being Puerto Rican, and if I'm shying away from it, how is that showing the cultura that I actually do uh, feel proud of being Puerto Rican? Yeah. If you want to see the change, you have to be a part of the change. I've never actually talked about this. Okay, yes. thinking of Cultura exclusive. This That's is, what we like. I've never talked about this in public. What's up, mi gente? Welcome back to Banking on Cultura. I am your host, Victoria Jen Rodriguez. And you know on this show, we talk about the vibrancy and complexity of Latino culture, entrepreneurship, and of course, all the one chinche in between. Now, my guest today is no, I would say, she's not shy on camera. That's number one. You've probably seen her on your TV screen in the mornings or in the evenings. Or you might know her um, from her amazing family that has contributed so much to Latino culture when it comes to music, jazz, and just adding so much, I would say, color to our cultura. And it is my absolute honor. Like, this is a little fangirl moment for me. So, guys, follow along with me, okay? Uh, but I am truly honored to have none other than the Miss Audrey Puente. I'm beginning oh, cultura. Gosh, wow. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> and I'm fangirling you because I had found you on Instagram and was following you and all your inspirational, like, like, shares are just amazing thank you you know what's so crazy about that is like you found me like the audrey puente (laughs) found me and i think that really goes to show like you never know you never know like where your content is going who is seeing your content listen don't sell yourself short content when there's powerful latinas i'm i'm bound to find you and i'm i will follow you i love that i love that See, you're a Latina's girl, girl. Yeah, we need, for sure. we need more of that I in the community. Am. If I, especially if you have like the Puerto Rican flag on your uh, bio, um, it's an instant <laughs> follow. Instant. You know, I recently added that. I've added that like a couple of months ago because I was like, you know what? 
we're going to stand out here yes. with my Boricua flag. And, you know, in true Boricua fashion, you know, we're very prideful. Right. And we love our flag. <laughs> right. We love our flag. Okay. Um, so for the people who don't know you, please introduce yourself. Okay. So uh, I happen to be a television meteorologist in New York City. Uh, I'm going on 25 years wow. in New York City. I'm like, when did that, when did that happen? When did that happen? I don't know. Uh, so I've been in the business for about approximately about 30 years. And <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> and uh, that's my main gig. I am a mom of three teenagers. Uh, have a few side hustles of my own. And uh, my, you know, I love being on social media and inspiring folks. And I, I, if you follow me. Audrey Puente at Audrey Puente. Uh, I do a lot of uh, weather inspiration because I find that I like to help people weather their storms, whether it's uh, in the environment or in life. And your social media is hysterical, by the way. Like sometimes when you post things, tell like me what you, you think is funny. Like you'll post something about like having like a bad hair day, but then you'll correlate it to something else, and it's just so funny. Like how you integrate, you know, when you have your son on your post when you put it right. in like your stories. Yes. it's always I always get a nice yeah. giggle out of that. I, or whenever you give us a behind the scenes of when you're at the studio and you're telling us. There's a lot of material there. I don't even post nearly half of what I'm actually sure happens in my daily life. Yeah. Amazing. So we like to kick off the show with some bochinche. So tell us something we can't Google about you. Okay. So uh, it's interesting because we had talked about a couple of things before. And I just thought of the other day, I secretly judged for the Grammys since I was a teenager. What? Okay, yeah. I feel like no one, I've never actually talked about this. Okay, yes. Banking on Cultura exclusive. This That's is, what we like. I've never talked about this in public. So, okay. Okay, so my father was Tito Puente, mm -hmm. a Latin jazz the artist. The Tito right. Puente. Yeah. Put some respect on that man's name. Thank you very much. <laughs> <You're cool. laughs> Warranted for sure, yes. Uh, so, he uh, you know, obviously got nominated for many Grammys every year. And what happens is when you, in the Grammy world, if you have a recording of any sort, it uh, automatically goes into um, nominations or the options to be nominated type of thing. Now, I don't know how they narrowed it down to the actual nominees that happen. But what happens is my father back then, because back then it was on paper. I don't, I'm sure they do it electronically now. Uh, they used to mail him the a packet with all the nominations for the Grammys of every single category. And there's usually five nominations in every category. And so he would fill it out. You literally like check off and fill out in a ballot at the time. You know, that's how it was done back then. I'm talking like late 70s going to the 80s, right? And so I would see it eventually. And I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? I think I eventually asked him one time. This is middle school. And he told me how it was. But he, he would ask me about some of the artists. Because when it came to the Latin artists, he knew everyone who he wanted to check off. Because the votes are done by people. Like, you're voted by your peers in mm -hmm. the Grammys. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so he would look through the, I would look through the packet and I would see, you know, you name it, like Madonna, Michael Jackson, <laughs> things like that. And, and he would allow me to pick out other categories. So as I got older, he would just hand me the packet. He would hand me the pack. He would just do all the Latin artists, Latin categories, <laughs> and then hand me the packet for the rest. And I literally voted like for, you know, record of the year, album of the year, uh, from all categories, like from, you know, uh, Oh my God, jazz! Although I could, you know, he probably did the jazz ones. He definitely did the Latin ones, but I did most of the, the pop culture ones, uh -huh. and I did that every year for like I don't know, like a decade. That's so cool. <laughs> yes, that you got to experience that. Yeah, it's a little so. Known so, what was it like growing up with a celebrity dad, like who was mm -hmm. so respected? In the genre he was in, musically, but also in the community. Like, mm -hmm. what was that like? What's interesting, I was born into it, so I didn't know anything different. It's mm -hmm. part, It was just my upbringing. It wasn't like one day he became famous. And uh, so growing up, I just remember my, my house being very loud <laughs> because it was <laughs> there was a radio in every single room. My dad constantly had Latin music or the Latin music stations playing in every room. And we always had a cast of characters coming in and out because musicians are, you know, they're interesting. Characters, yes, yes, they're characters. Artists, right. artists, creatives. I mean, I'm talking like, yes. you know, Celia Cruz, you know, wow. I mean, when she walks in the door, it's, it's magnanimous, you know, her, her presence, you know, uh -huh. uh, Carlos Santana. I mean, you know, uh, I, name them. They probably were in my house. Right. Johnny Pacheco, another one always around. Uh, Yolanda Duque, um, La India, you know, so. Uh, there was always these people that with huge presence, like these are, you know, they have to have big egos. They're, they're very 
big and magnanimous, yeah. all of them. And so I was constantly surrounded by this greatness of all kinds, even though it was all one in one genre of music, but they all had their individual place, you know, in um, that genre. And so with that said, though, I also lived in a neighborhood that was, you know, uh, suburban uh, New York. I lived in Rockland County growing up and uh, wanted to have it like tamed down that we had this loud household. <laughs> With all these like characters coming in and out all the time and, you know, musicians and bands playing and things like that. Because also when we got together, whether it was at my house or someone like Martin Cohen's house, that was a big one. He was the uh, creator of Latin Percussion, which is the instrument uh, company. Okay. Uh, There were jam sessions no matter whose house you were at. There was always a party. Picture any Latinos. We always have parties, Mm -hmm. right? And when you have it with musicians, there's a jam jam session going on. It was pretty wild till late in the night. And uh, so it was very loud. <laughs> my, that's my childhood. Like it was always in me. And then traveling the world with my father when he went on tour. Uh, when I was little, I didn't go that much because we had school. But when we got older, my younger brother and I, we would go on tour with them. Uh, at the time, you know, of course, I didn't appreciate it. I was a teenager who wanted to hang out with my friends. And I was being dragged around like, you know, Switzerland for New Year's and things like that. Right. And living I, like listen, such a dope life. Right. And right now I, I realize what it sounds like because when I was living it, it was – I'll, you know, it's somewhat annoying because I was a teenager who just wanted to be right. my friends, like any normal teenager. Now, looking back, of course, I'm like, wow, I really lived an exceptional childhood and teenage years. And I have great gratitude for it all. And I really started to turn it when I think I got in my 20s. That's when it really started to turn. I started realizing, oh, wow, this is this is different. Yeah. <laughs> this is different. Yeah. That's so interesting. Like, you always hear artists say, like, their kids humble them because, like, your mm-hmm. kids don't really care. Girl, that- <laughs> I got stories. I got my favorite. I'll tell you my favorite dad story. So my father, of course, worked late nights all the time. And God bless him. He always woke up in the morning to say goodbye to my brother and I when we would go to school. Uh-huh. And I'm talking this is a man who would come in at 4 in the morning. And, and still got up like at 7 a.m. to say to say goodbye. Now our bus stop in elementary school and middle school was right across the street from where we lived in the house, and but all, so all the neighborhood kids uh, would be at that bus stop. So there's my my dad would be at the door waving goodbye, but in his bathrobe or like his pajamas because he had just <laughs> right. gotten home right, like right, two right. or three hours earlier, uh-huh. right, from work. And I was like, oh my god, please can. <laughs> Can you please not come to the door? It's embarrassing because everyone else's dad is going out with their suits and their briefcases and you're in your pajamas at 7 a.m. And I remember at one point actually telling my my dad and my mom, like, can't dad go to an office like everyone else's parents? Not knowing, Mm, not knowing. I'm telling the great Tito Puente, can you please, like, do you really need- Get an office job. Do you need to play drums? (laughs) I don't know how to tell my my friends when they ask when your parents, you play drums. Right. No- yeah. Not realizing at all. It was. I was so. It's funny. So in that sense, I guess we humbled my dad because we'd be like, "Really, you play drums?" Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Not realizing, like, like no big like, deal, right? Like who he is. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't hit me until later on, until my teenage years, and I was like, "Okay." I bet you would give anything for him to come to the door in his robe now. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was something I spoke about at his eulogy, actually. Yeah, yeah. All Aww. the all the sounds and not the music sounds, the, the other sounds of being my father. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, daddy's girls be the best. Girl, I right love here. It. I'm here. We are blessed to be daddy's girls. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so you said you grew up around greatness, I right? Do. You had highly influential folks coming in and out of your house, all these influences on you. Did you ever feel like pressure to be amazing and to Mm -hmm. do amazing things? What's up, mi gente? Are you looking for mentorship and the place to secure the big bag? Have you ever watched me here on the Banking on Cultura podcast and thought to yourself, you know what? I want to work with Victoria Jen. Or maybe you thought to yourself, I want to be a part of her network of badass women and entrepreneurs. Well, guess what? You absolutely can. Join me this November, November 15th through the 16th in the heart of New York City for my seventh annual Secure the Big Bag and Wellness Summit. Let's face it. So many of us are tired, burnt out, ready to throw in the top well, honey, and quite frankly, we want to dedicate ourselves to the soft life. But what if there was a way for us to achieve both time and financial freedom and also have a healthy, well-balanced life? What if you could secure the big bag, build a business that fuels you versus drains you 
as well as build a solid network of business besties who want to support and motivate you while also centering self. This summit is the premier destination for the latest marketing, sales, and AI tools that can 10x your business while also nurturing your well-being. Learn from top experts from both business and wellness, including executives from the corporate sector, so that you can explore corporate-level opportunities that can elevate your business to new heights. Ensuring you're not just prepared, but fully equipped to dominate in 2025 and beyond. This is your opportunity for your business to thrive while you do too. Head over to securethebigbag.com to check out the agenda and all the heavy hitters that will be in the building. I cannot wait to see you in New York City, mi gente. It's go time. Actually, no, I did not. Uh, I think I just absorbed it. I just absorbed it. My father, people always ask me, you know, things I've learned from him. My, the greatest lesson I learned was to follow my passion. He specifically told me, figure out what it is you love to do and you figure out how to get to pay paid to do it and you'll never feel like you're working and I know people have said this in various ways but it is it was so true because I love weather I love meteorology and once I figured out how to do that and have a job doing it because I didn't think that was a possibility I actually went to college to be a lawyer right and it was my last semester where I had an internship opening in uh, the weather department at a local tv station and I jumped in and it changed the trajectory of my life and I was so passionate about and still am you know, I often say, don't tell my bosses that I would do this for free. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I love it so much. Yeah. And he was on the money. I mean, it was so, it, you know, he he just he just led by example. And mm-hmm. I was surrounded by all of these other people that were just, they were so passionate about everything they did. And I just absorbed it. I feel like it was just, yeah, I ate it up. Yeah. So a Latina meteorologist, like, mm-hmm. how? Like, how... <laughs> Right. Like, how did you know you were fascinated by the weather? Uh, you know, my earliest memories were, were um, hurricanes uh, Gloria and um, that, that came through and actually broke through a window in my kitchen when I was little. And, and Frederick was the hurricane that came before that. So we had two in a row at this time. And I just remember just being fascinated by the whole thing and the flooding water that came in the window. I know it sounds may sound scary, but and it was. But it, I don't know, for some reason, it just clicked. And I always found myself... When my parents would watch the news, because back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, the news was on. Like, when it came on, people watched. It's not like today where things are streaming, you can watch whenever you want. When the news came on, you everyone had to sit down and watch it at that time. And But I was always interested in the weather part, always. And I was able to go to NBC Studios at 11. My dad brought me because who he was. Of course, I didn't know at the time. Right. You know, I just thought he knew somebody that he could hook us up, not because he was Tito Puente and they would let him into. So, right? So I came and... Uh, was introduced to Frank Field, who was a legendary meteorologist or weather person on NBC. And he put me in front of that green wall, chroma key. And I was fascinated by the whole thing. I'm like, wow, this is just amazing. Uh, I met Chuck and Sue Simmons, Chuck Scarbo, Sue Simmons, their legendary team here in New York City. And uh, it was it was such an impact on me that now to this day, when people come to visit or they bring their kids, I'm aware of what this moment can do so I really pay attention and show them everything I possibly can while they're doing that quick visit because Mm -hmm. it was quick when I made but that was it I I knew that wow this is something I'm really into that was the seed it was and I didn't again click until the internship I had when I was in my last semester in college and that changed my life yeah Mm -hmm. I love that so you have had a fascinating career Mm -hmm. so 25 years plus Mm -hmm. doing the damn thing (laughs) So when you first started, did you feel like because you come from such a uh, well-known family, um, did you feel like you had to kind of like trailblaze your own lane, like prove yourself like I didn't get here because of my dad. I got here because I earned it. Like I put in the sweat equity. Yes. And I did. I did put in the sweat equity, I feel like. Uh, it's interesting. It didn't never dawned on me that anybody would hire me because I'm Tito Puente's daughter. <laughs> it just, it just <laughs> okay. didn't. I felt like I did the work and I earned the spot. I mm-hmm. really did. Uh, when I decided I wanted to do uh, meteorology on TV or be a television meteorologist, I again, I was on my path to law school and I graduated and I told you know my parents, I told my parents I'm not going to law school. And they said, what, what, really? What, what are you going to do? Because the plan was for me to be an attorney in the music industry. Oh, that was the plan. Okay. Because that was the bookworm of the family. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, they said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do, they're like, what are you going to do? I said, I want to do weather on television. They said, what, 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 what is that? And I said, I'm going to figure it out. 
And I did. And once I figured out what was required to learn to do, uh, I did what I had to do. And so with that said is that I studied meteorology. I ended up going to take classes in New York City while working behind the scenes at a television station, which ironically is the one I work at now. It was my first TV job out of college. Um, mind you, I got in the door because I, my father knew some, he knew somebody. I said, hey, Felipe, Felipe Luciano, he's a legendary uh, broadcaster also. Hey, I'm interested in TV. Can we have, can we meet? And boom, that, that set me up as a trainee at Fox 5. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did the thing. I did the thing. Like I had to study meteorology. I ended up, you know, learning about being in front of a chroma key. I absorbed everything I could tugging on, you know, Al Roker's jacket. He eventually became my mentor. You know, what, whatever weather person was around, I asked questions. I came in on weekends uh, with Nick Gregory at the time, who's I'm now working with, but I used to come in on weekends. Amazing. And like, I, I'm, you know, I showed interest. I was eager. I was willing to do the work. And so, you know, I eventually went back to college, got my master's in meteorology. So I did all the things that were required. So I, I feel like I did earn the spot. Mm -hmm. And at, back then, you know, women, we were barely out there. And Latin women, there was no one. Yeah. I saw no one. So in a way, I sort of thought there is my opening so to speak, you know, I saw the opportunity. I'm like, where are we? Like, the, we're not being represented here. I mean, my role models growing up were, you know, Edis Chacon, uh, Rita Moreno, um, you know, Maria on Sesame Street, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, the, so I sort of somehow was aware that I was trailblazing. I was setting a tone, like, this is it. And and again, I'm follow I was just following my passion. Yeah. And listen, I, I realized I was the only female Latina in the room. Okay, that's fine. I'm okay with that. It's sort of, I think it made me, I think the men especially were amused by me at first, but once I would open my mouth and prove that, uh, no, I actually earned my way here, it became a different story. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like I earned the respect over time because again, I did the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you definitely have made a name for yourself, mm -hmm. winning four Emmys yes. and just <laughs> killing it. And we're going to circle back to that because I want to know what's the process of getting an <laughs> Emmy, okay? Because making a cultura needs an Emmy. Uh, but you said something really significant that I think a lot of our listeners, our audience can really resonate with and perhaps even struggling with right now. You said you were in school, you had this path. You were mm -hmm. on the path to law school. You were going to be a lawyer in the music industry. Mm -hmm. And then last semester, you decided to pivot, mm -hmm. flip the script. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks find themselves on this path, right? I went to school for this. I'm working in this industry. So this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for someone who is over kind of the routine of their lives, even though their area of expertise and is in something, but they want to pivot but they just don't know how, what would be your advice to them? Well, I think initially it, it, I would offer to be clear. What is it exactly that you actually want, right? Because you can't put in the GPS, I want to go to Connecticut, right? You need to have an exact address <laughs> to get to where you want to be. So once you're super clear to on um, what exactly you want, like for me, I knew like I want to do television. I want to be a television meteorologist in New York City. And New York City was because it was my home, whether it was, you know, Cleveland or wherever. I wanted to go home. So, you, and then you reverse engineer. You Once you're clear on what it is that you want, where you want to go, what you want to be, reverse engineer. How do I, what, what is, what do I need to do to get there? What are the steps? I mean, now we have Google. I didn't have that. I had Barnes and Noble, you know. So mm -hmm. like, and, uh, and I also went to a lot of conferences back then. I networked my way through as well. Every job I ever got, I did get because I knew somebody. But it's not how you think. I did it because I went to these conferences and networked and, you know, uh, maintained relationships, followed up, all the, all the things. And, uh, in fact, you did a podcast on this recently. About a conference? Uh, no, how to network at conferences. Yes. I, yes. That's right. Uh, you, you gave amazing <laughs> tips. I meant, to, I, want, I meant to reach out to you to tell you. That was on the money. I Thank mean, you. every single thing. I was like, yep. Yep, I would say. Oh my God, way. Audrey Fuente yes. is the listener of Vicky yeah. Cultura. Like I can't, and she's a guest now. Okay, sorry. That I had to just, pop in a few. In I, had get, I had to get a few, uh, a few episodes. In. I was like, let me see what's going on over here. Yeah, I, I was very impressed. You really Thank nailed you. it on that podcast. Whatever number that is, you know, put it in the show notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, once you're clear, I feel like then it's about reverse engineering. Now, 
I don't recommend like jumping, you know, full in without a plan of sorts. And some people say, you know, you should have a job, you know, uh, don't go after the next job until, you know, in other words, have a job before you. Yes. Was it, don't or you quit. go after the next one. Or, you know, something don't like quit that. your job, job right now until you have yeah, the next yeah, one in yeah. place. Yeah. Something like that. Right. So and listen, there were times where I didn't have the next job. And but I still believed in what I was doing and I was focused. So I, it was depends on the individual. Where are you at and what kind of risk you're willing to take or, or res- can responsibly take, actually, because mm-hmm. you need to be responsible if, if you have a family, things like that. I mean, I did all this when I was you know young. I was in my teens and 20s. So. It's you almost it's that's Did the time you feel like to take it was risks. easier for you to pivot like at a younger age. Like what about people who have more seasonality? Let's say you got 30 years in the game somewhere mm-hmm. or a decade and you're like, oh, this isn't for me anymore. Like, how would you suggest they pivot same way or something different? Same, I think. You know, I think now it's so much easier, I would say, to make that pivot because with the internet, I mean, the the possibilities are so endless in careers that you can create for yourself now. I mean, entrepreneurship is amazing right now. I mean, people can create so many different new things of what they're passionate about. I mean, I have ideas of my own about my what's next, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, I see how it's possible with just being on your phone. I mean, there's so, you could build things right off your phone. It's, um, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you said something that was really important and I want to drive home for folks. It's you had this internship and that was like it. Everything mm-hmm. clicked. And I think that's a great takeaway for folks mm-hmm. is put yourself in new environments, do something mm-hmm. you've never done, volunteer, because that's what's going to expose you. And I think this is really helpful also for someone who is stuck, who doesn't know what they want to do, mm-hmm. who doesn't know the exact address in Connecticut. They just know Connecticut. Right. <laughs> they don't know exactly where right. in Connecticut they want to go, right, using your example. Mm-hmm. So it's important for you to go outside mm-hmm. and participate mm-hmm. and experience and shadow sure. someone and ask someone for their time and pick their brain and you know, do I will, your research. I will say, uh, again, be clear. First, you got to be clear about what you want to do and because uh, if – how are you going to meet people and then you'd be like, I don't really know, you know, when they but ask you. what if you, you're not clear? What if okay. you're like in that phase? Great question. I would offer to really explore what are you truly passionate about? What would you be willing to do that you actually didn't get paid for? And I'm not saying don't get paid. I'm just saying, like, yeah. I feel about that way about the weather. I, I'm, I'm already looking at the weather maps. It's something I do when I'm not actually at the physical job anyway. Mm-hmm. So how great is it that I actually get paid to do what I would, I would be doing it anyway, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And so what are those things? What do people tell you? that you would be good at, right? That that people get that a lot. Oh, you'd be good at this, you'd be good at that. Pay attention to those things. What do you feel in your gut that truly like gives you, like puts a smile on your face to actually be doing, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's like, it could be gardening, right? Mm-hmm. It could be floral arrangement, whatever it is. Hair, cutting hair, or styling it, whatever it is. Then there's a conference for everything. There is a yes. conference for everything. Even so much so like when my daughter, my oldest was, thinking about whether she was going to go to college or not, I actually gave her the offer. Listen, if you want to take a gap year or maybe not go at all, but take a year, I will pay to take you to a series of conferences of things that you are passionate about. Because I learned more in conferences than I ever did in the classroom. Uh, I needed my meteorology degree. But conference, going to conferences and networking, they have workshops. There's like, uh, you know, seminars. I mean, the networking is just you know, invaluable. Right. It's worth every penny if you really mm-hmm. love like fitness or whatever it is. Like, so I told my daughter, name five things you're interested in and I'll be willing to like spend this X amount of money and we'll find a conference and we'll go and just to explore. Yeah. I would offer that would be a good way to jump in. I love that. Mm-hmm. You want to stop me? <laughs> <laughs> and, if you, and listen, if money is a thing, which it is for some folks, there's free things all over the place. I mean, there come are. on. There's, the, yes. you, know, you can start with Facebook groups. Uh, there's free uh, meetups. There's, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. You just do your homework. You have, yeah. I, I know if money's an issue, I know you at least have a cell phone and an internet connection so right. you can Google anything. Right. Or yeah. not, go to the library. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's Wi-Fi over there. Yeah. So let's go back to <laughs> Emmys. So sure. four-time Emmy mm-hmm. award winner. Mm-hmm. Like, how does that come about? Like, how do you get an Emmy? Okay, so uh, I didn't know for quite a while, believe it. I was until I didn't start getting them until I figured out, oh, that's how, and that's that's when I started earning. Them. Okay, okay, okay. So you literally submit a piece of work into the Emmy nomination process. They don't come find you. You have to put oh, yourself okay. in the pool to be nominated. I didn't know that either for a long time in my career. Never thought to ask, and no one told me. Okay. So, but once I found out, I was like, "Oh, I think I might have asked one day. Hey, how do you how did you get that Emmy? How does it work? Oh, well, you submit your work. So in television, we literally find pieces that we do, 
and we enter them in submission. Now, the way it works in the New York Emmys that I am a part of, uh, those submissions get narrowed down, I think, at some point. Uh, I think I'm not actually sure about that part. But what happens is, because I'm actually a judge uh, in the New York Emmys. Uh, oh, okay. And anyone who's in uh, the industry can be a judge. I volunteer to do so. Okay. So not everybody does it because it is time consuming. But I do it regularly. Okay. So what happens is I then receive uh, once I'm accepted to a certain panel to judge, and I always do weather. I don't. I only okay. do weather. Damn! I was about to be like you. Can oh, I'll hook you up? No, <laughs> no. Well, that's the thing. I they don't allow you to judge in the region that you are actually in. So I don't judge oh, anyone here in okay. the Northeast, right? My, yeah, I can only judge anywhere else across the country okay. other than the the region that I'm in. Mm. That that's how okay. they keep it fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, being in weather though, I've been around for a while and I've met a lot of people, so I do intend to see people that I know. But I'm very um, I, I do it right. I follow the yes, rules. Yes yes, 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 yes. I follow the rules. And so what happens <laughs> is for someone like me, there's certain criteria. Like you, you get judged on three, um, three things. It's usually content, uh, creativity, and execution. Mm -hmm. And then they have the requirements under those specific things. Is this the content of the of the the um, category? And the because there's certain things like it could be weather. Um, presentations, or it could be a weather story. Like, you don't have to be a meteorologist to win a weather Emmy. You could have done a story on a weather event that went on in the news. There's all kinds of things. There's long okay. format, short format. There's a lot of different categories. Okay. Gosh, I think there's over 60 categories. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a, okay. crazy. What time of year does this normally happen? Uh, I'm judging right now, actually. Um, it happens year-round because each of the regions have their award ceremonies at a different time. Okay. Yeah. Now, now to submit it, they changed it. Now it's from January first to December thirty first of the year before. So right now we're in twenty twenty four. Okay. So submissions would be for January first to basically for all of twenty twenty three. Okay. From the first of the year to the last day. Okay. And that okay. would so in other words, when we have our ceremony, the actually Emmy Awards that will happen in the fall, right? This fall, it would be for you're winning for twenty twenty three. Correct. Oh, okay. Correct. So I should be submitting now for. 2024 for fall 2025 to get awarded uh well there'll be a window to submit okay yeah okay. They'll, they'll let you know all right um you have to check in with them and then you, you i forgot when the window is actually okay <laughs> i'm gonna find out i'm gonna do yeah. some research yeah you know, there's a window because okay. uh, the window closed for new york this yeah. region because right now we have our nominations list out so i i'm up for another nomination oh, <laughs> oh listen <laughs> talk you ish girl <laughs> oh, yes. yes i'm not really nominated right <laughs> Well, uh, so yeah, so that yeah, you'll you only submit during the window time. There's a certain like couple, okay, like, like two months. You they tell you, mm -hmm. oh, this is the deadline to submit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then they go out and now you know, they get judged, and then you find out at the award ceremony whether yeah. you win or not. Where do you have your Emmys? I have them proudly displayed on a nice like display table. When you walk in, it's like boom, people uh -huh. see them. Uh huh. Yeah. Like in your home. Yes. Lovely. There's four of them right there. Lovely, lovely. Glistening in gold. Lovely. <laughs> I think that's so cool. It is. I, I I was floored when I saw my first one because uh, I've seen them before and I, I, I it's weird. I never thought I would have. One. I never th never thought to have one. I never thought I would have one. I didn't didn't think I couldn't have one. Right. I just didn't know what to do. And then when I figured it out, again, yeah. just find out what you need so to you do. So you can nominate yourself. Uh, no. Meaning you're submitting right. on your behalf. Right. Correct. And then a committee. Right. Decides who gets nominated. Right. And then that committee judges on the nominations and decides who wins. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so, like, I have four Emmys. They're not all weather, actually. Oh, okay. Right, because I do a variety of things at, at my station. Okay. So uh, well, the, the first one was, which we made... It's my favorite right, one, right, of course. Right, 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 right. Uh, we do a weather special every year, and I actually spearhead the, us submitting it every year. Okay. <laughs> because I go, I go around, I collect everybody's, you know, like money, information. I'm like, okay, let's go. We oh, it costs money to nominate. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, girl, tell there's us a fee. That. Wait, how much is the fee? Oh my gosh, you know, I, it depends if you're a member or not. Oh. Uh, it's tiered, like, uh, yeah, it's tiered. So if oh. you're a member, you have to pay one price. If you're not a member, so you can actually submit and not be a member of the um, Emmy Award organization or okay. Emmy Ca Academy. Okay. Uh, so there's that, yeah. Interesting. Okay. And so, yeah. And so if you're in a group, like if there's how many, you know, group of people are doing it together, you split the cost. And uh, so when you're judging, do you take someone being a member into consideration? No. We don't know if they are or not when they oh, submit. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't know. Okay, okay. And when you're making your selections of like what you want to submit, what mm -hmm. is that process like? Like how are you assessing? Great question. So 
you got to get a vibe. I keep a running log in my phone on a note, you know, notes of things that I've done during the year. I'm like, oh, you know what? I really liked that. I, I think I liked I did that. I'm going to put that down as possible Emmy submission, you know. Mm -hmm. So when the window comes up, I kind of go through and I'll look, I'll look back on some of the stuff at the station and be like, you know what? That one. I think I want to do that. So that's how it happens for me. Um, the other Emmys I earned are, again, they were in a group. I, I do a special every year called Tower of Heroes. It, it's something to do with um, the, the climbing of One World Trade Center. We do stories on that relate to 9-11 because, I mean, there's just endless amount of stories that yeah, came yeah. out of that. Uh, we won them for that one. Another one was our weekend newscast. So, you know, everyone on the team won that one. Uh, and the one, another one I'm really – I'm proud of all of them. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but another one, uh, we did a – uh, special called Caribbean in the City and I highlighted six prominent like New Yorkans, which I loved oh, that piece I was I when that. we won that I was like yes I yes love it. yes it was I'm very proud of that one because it was highlighting New Yorkans, mm -hmm. and uh, it was great yeah so do you need to submit work that happened in that year that you're submitting for? yes it can't be like past work no it has to be the, within that uh, year that um, eligibility year, okay. which would be January first to December thirty first. Usually, the, like twenty oh, right now would be for twenty twenty three. Oh, yeah. So the Emmys we earn coming up in this coming uh, award ceremony, the the material came from twenty twenty three. Oh, so I need to get a move on it because I got some popping material from twenty twenty three that could. <laughs> go really really well yeah. okay you have to find out i don't know how it works yeah your, i gotta your, do some well, yeah. research to figure out but i know they give out emmys for like podcast and they youtube do. shows and right even stuff you do on social media mm -hmm. like like you said there's several there's so yeah. many categories there's even categories for like for. traffic reporting makeup mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize it was a, 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 there's an award for makeup wow, i didn't yeah. know that either right okay yeah there's a lot okay. of there's a lot of opportunity okay yeah, you, All right, well, let's manifest like this yeah. Victoria Emmy Award winner. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> manifest this. Yeah. You can reach out anytime if you want yes. to chat more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, my goodness. Okay, I'm so yeah. excited. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I need to have my shrine. You know what? One and of it's my... true, once you know, you know. Like, because I didn't know how to do yeah. it. But now that I'm telling you, now I can sense. You know, now you realize, oh, wait, this is actually possible. Yeah, because now yeah. I know what it is. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um. So I don't know if you knew her, but her name was Shirley Rodriguez Romaneski. Yes. Do you know who she is? Absolutely. So Shirley is like my second mother. Mm. She took me under her wing when I was in college mm. and like put me on the board of a charter school when I graduated college, got me my first job, Lehman Brothers after college, like made that introduction for me. She took me under her wing. Mm -hmm. um, she told me how to eat lobster, like <laughs> all the things. I love it. And she had this, I remember visiting her home. She had a home right across the street from Central Park. And um, she had like this shrine of all her awards mm -hmm. and accomplishments. She had all the pictures, Nelson Mandela, like all the pictures. And I remember in that moment thinking to myself, like, I'm going to do this. Like, this is what I, I, I'm going to emulate this. Like, I'm going to figure out mm -hmm. how to have all of my accolades on like a wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the seed that was planted back then mm -hmm. that now, is coming to fruition, meeting you, putting me on mm -hmm. game with the Emmys. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to Shirley Rodriguez from this game. Oh, God bless so her. Much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she was, was such a uh, force. Yes, such she, a force. force. Yeah. And a lot of the woman I am today is because of her. Mm. Because I got to literally be her right hand. Like she would take me to everything. Wow. I would be in all the insider conversations with top politicians. She would take me to Washington. She would take me to Albany. She would have me in her room when she was negotiating, when she worked at the Empire State Development uh, Building and she was with um, Cuomo under the time. Like she would bring me into these meetings and I would just be a fly on the wall and she mm -hmm. would just let me observe and I would see her in action. Like oh 100 gosh. Hispanic Women, her nonprofit. Like I was an intern at 100 Hispanic Women when mm -hmm. I was in college. That's that's kind of like how I met her mm -hmm. and we met and like instantly connected. Well, I know you, whatever you put your mind to, you're going to do because she to have her as your mentor, like, yeah, uh, amazing, amazing force. Yeah, she really, really was. Now I see why you're so forced. You're, you're oh, an amazing thank you. force. Yes, listen, <laughs> I, I come from a lineage of women yes. who like poured into me yeah. um, and showed me the way. And yeah. she was definitely one of those women who like saw something yeah. in me. When I needed her most. Well, now that you've told me that connection, like I, I see you. you like see now, me now I see you. Right. You connect somebody with someone else, and you're like, oh, if that, if you're connected with that person, I know that you yeah. are something. Yeah. yeah. If she was still alive, mm. Audrey, like, mm. 
I just think about it all the time. Like I, I would be in a completely different place than where I'm at right now because she was just so, I'm gonna put you in this room, I'm gonna introduce you to this person, we're gonna position you here, this is where you need to be. Like that's how she rolled with me. Mm -hmm. So I just know like I would be like, 10 years ahead of where I am right now. Mm. But I also know like she's guiding me Absolutely. in this moment as yeah. well. She actually set you up. She did. Yeah, She did. Yeah. She set me up. She gave me the layup. And yeah. now I'm just like taking it. You know, another story I'll share with you and then we can move on. Mm. I host a woman's event every year. And the year she passed away was the same. And they were hosting her funeral was the same day of my conference. Mm. And so I dedicated the entire conference to her. Like I had a whole opening slideshow for her. Like everyone in that room knew who Shirley was. And like she touched them in that room. And that was like my dedication to her because I couldn't be there. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. It, bring, it makes yeah. me want to cry. So yeah, it was, it, was, so it was so beautiful. It was a moment. Yes. It was a moment. Wow, um, amazing. But yeah, I'll always like when I accept Miami in oh. my speech. Oh. <laughs> I can hear it. I can already hear it. She I can will already be hear one of the women She'll that I mentioned you. in that speech, for mm. sure, for sure. Mm. So let's get into the Talk That Talk segment. What's up, mi gente? Are you looking for mentorship and the place to secure the big bag? Have you ever watched me here on the Banking on Cultura podcast and thought to yourself, you know what? I want to work with Victoria Jen. Or maybe you thought to yourself, I want to be a part of her network of badass women and entrepreneurs. Well, guess what? You absolutely can. Join me this November, November 15th through the 16th in the heart of New York City for my seventh annual Secure the Big Bag and Wellness Summit. Let's face it. So many of us are tired, burnt out, ready to throw in the towel, honey. And quite frankly, we want to dedicate ourselves to the soft life. But what if there was a way for us to achieve both time and financial freedom and also have a healthy, well-balanced life? What if you could secure the big bag, build a business that fuels you versus drains you as well as build a solid network of business besties who want to support and motivate you while also centering self. This summit is the premier destination for the latest marketing, sales, and AI tools that can 10x your business while also nurturing your well-being. Learn from top experts from both business and wellness, including executives from the corporate sector, so that you can explore corporate-level opportunities that can elevate your business to new heights. Ensuring you're not just prepared, but fully equipped to dominate in 2025 and beyond. This is your opportunity for your business to thrive while you do too. Head over to securethebigbag.com to check out the agenda and all the heavy hitters that will be in the building. I cannot wait to see you in New York City, mi gente. It's go time. And this is where we address something taboo in the cultura, uh, something that you feel passionate about or something that you want to draw uh, some dialogue around that maybe is not being spoken about enough. So talk to us. What is something taboo in the cultura? Oh, you know, I think we talked about this and I sort of, uh, again, another thing, you bring bringing out all the things I don't talk about publicly, Let's right? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I, I worry about us discriminating against our own. That's what I worry about. Um, I think for me, my experience with that, with me saying that it comes from an experience of not being Latina enough in some rooms and feeling like because of that, I'm being shunned out by my own people and it's hurtful. And I'm not, I, I now know, you know, through time that I'm not the only one that has experienced that. And uh, I would love to just have that not be. Right. Because as I told you earlier, like when I see, you know, powerful Latinas on Instagram, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I follow you right away. And, and if I see a, you know, Puerto Rican flag on whatever, I'm not even reading what you're doing. <laughs> I'm already follow because that's, that's how I choose to show yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if everybody did. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, there unfortunately have been moments where I've, I have felt that I wasn't. I don't want to say terms that, that, that would make anyone, but I, I love, you know what I love about our culture? We're so different. Like there's so many different facets of us. We're, it's not just one mold, right? Mm -hmm. We we come in different shades, We're not right? A monolith, we come yes. in different shapes. We come in different, like even in different like languages, countries, like skin tones. Uh, right. I, I, it's, there's, we have such a melting pot within our own cultura. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, it, it sort of confuses me why I or anyone else within that would be felt like we don't belong. Mm-hmm. Because we, there is no one mold for all of us, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like I, I have not been part of groups because I felt like I wasn't either loud enough, dark enough. I didn't have enough of an accent. I didn't speak Spanglish enough or full on, you know, Latina enough. I didn't speak enough street talk or whatever it was. It was always some, not, not always, it's a, but the times that I've had these experiences, that's what it was. I felt like I just didn't look as Latin as they were. And listen, growing up, like I was always mistaken for Italian or Greek, you know, and but again, like I didn't, I saw so many shades of us in our own culture. I didn't understand it with, from within us. Why did, why I still wasn't being, you know, kind of within the fold of, it, of some things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You hear this a lot. Can you give us an example? Ooh, <laughs> more things I'm not, I haven't spoken about, right? Uh, getting the hands sweaty now. Well, this is important, right? And, yeah. And one of the reasons why Banking on Cultura exists is the this is happening often right. and it's impacting how we show up in the world it's also impacting how we collaborate or don't collaborate with each other and i believe it's 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 one of the reasons why we can be our own worst enemy mm-hmm. and it's because we don't talk about it we yeah. act like it's not happening or yes, you're right. if we talk about it it's in our own little separate silos but when many of us are experiencing the same thing mm-hmm. something needs to change Correct. Um, so yes, I would love an so, example. Uh, I one that really sticks out, the one just struck me immediately was uh, in college. Uh, I very much wanted to be in a sorority. Like I just when I and I mean, truth be told, I wanted to do it because I wanted to go to the parties. <laughs> like, I mean, they were kind of exciting. Yeah, not listen, lie. yeah. And so uh, <laughs> right, I'm a very I was very social in high school. I was going to college. I'm like, I want to be. I want to do that whole thing, you know. And uh, and so there was. Um, you know, I did the whole rush process. There was a Latin sorority starting up. And I thought, well, I want to do that one, right? Because, you know, because just because I'm Puerto Rican, I should do that one. And I felt shunned. I felt shunned. Uh, most of the girls were, I guess, way more Latina than me. And it, it hurt. And so I ended up joining a predominantly Jewish sorority, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, I did. And interestingly enough, I brought in Latin girls into the sorority over time <laughs> because they saw me. When, it, you know, you meet the girls in Rush, I would always um, sway over to the Latin girls and I'd be like, hi, you know, meet them and stuff. And my house ended up becoming more mixed. It wasn't predominantly, you know, it was predominantly Jewish, but there were, you know, other um, cultures and sorts in there. And so, yeah, that was, that was, you know, I, I when I think, it's sad when I think about that because... It didn't have to be that way, I don't think. Yeah. And I would have loved to have had that that little piece like you – because you're always connected with your house, you know, your sorority house, your your group. And um, I don't have that in the Latin form. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love my, you know, I love my Jewish <laughs> right, right, right. house. I do. Right, right. They're great girls. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that, that would be the example I would share. It's interesting that you say that because I find that a lot of um, – a lot of us tend to go where we are accepted, right? And mm-hmm. go where we feel welcomed. And it mm-hmm. is unfortunate that Or even that where you think it's familiar. Right. That that's why I was going going mm-hmm. that that's what's familiar to me. I I, I like to be around my Latinos. Totally. Yeah. And I believe that's why you find a lot of, you know, Latinos in black communities mm-hmm. like collaborating, making money together, mm-hmm. making moves together because there's an acceptance there that unfortunately you don't see in the Latino community. It's not as prominent. Like for example, I was having this conversation with a girlfriend of mine and we were talking about how her and I, a lot of our opportunities that are coming to us are through black women, not through Latinas. Latinas are actually the Mm ones talking shit Mm -hmm. and trying to block us from Mm -hmm. the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And how can we change this? What needs to happen? I know for myself, I've pushed my because that, listen that experience and maybe a couple of others that had made me feel like well you know it made me shy away actually from groups but as I got older right because this was like teenagers years and um you know twenties but as I got older and, and started being in my career and meeting more Latinas uh, um 
and realizing that I had a place that I needed, that I was being moving into a leadership position by being who I was, being a meteorologist, a Latin one, that kind of sort of thing. I needed to insert myself is what I did. I basically inserted myself in Latin groups. I, I just showed up. And I, maybe the TV thing made it easier for me to show up because now I was known. I'll, I'll give that. I'll, I'll, I'll give that. Yet I still needed to show up like because you know, I was scared. Mm-hmm. I was scared. And I still showed up at groups and felt like, you know, I don't speak fluent Spanish. You know, I speak Spanglish, you know, and are they going to really accept me? And then, you know, people will talk to me in Spanish and I'll answer in English. I do understand. Uh, I didn't know if it was going to be offensive, but I think over time, well, first of all, they, they they accepted me, and I think part of it may have been the TV thing. Okay, <laughs> like you know, mm-hmm. okay. However, I took that. I feel like I took. They gave me the ball, and I ran with it by showing up in a supportive manner for whatever the organization was. I've been on boards of organizations. Um, I offer myself to speak anywhere. I host many things, uh, and so yeah. So I feel like I. I I inserted myself. I had to. Mm-hmm. I had to because I had to. I had to show that I actually love being Latin. I mm-hmm. love being Puerto Rican. And if I'm shying away from it, how is that showing the cultura that I actually do uh, feel proud of being Puerto Rican? Yeah. I actually have to. I have to walk the walk. I have to yeah. talk the talk. Yeah. Be the change you want to see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a great takeaway. So if you can. If you're resonating with any of this and you feel like an outcast or you feel like you're not being accepted. Reach out to me. I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Reach out to Audrey. She'll talk to you. Um, but, but, but the main takeaway is insert yourself. Like it's a leadership uh, attribute. Like if you want to see the change, you have to be a part of the change. And it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't happen if you're just talking about it in conversations with your close confidants. It happens when you take some action and yeah. you take start risks. leading by example, right? Yeah, take and taking risk. the risk and inserting yourself, even yeah. though at first you might feel like, and listen, you can I'm be scared. Enough. You can be scared and do it anyway. You know, that's right. the definition of courage, right? Right. Uh, having the fear and doing it anyway, and, and and you'll find your people. I feel like I found I found my groups. I. Actually, I don't think I even found anybody that actually shut me out after. But but the thing is, like, you start to feel. And once you're confident in yourself and you know, like, listen, I know I deserve, I, I earned my spot here. I deserve to be here. Mm-hmm. I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who, uh, she's uh, she's amazing. She, her, her name's Paris Alexandra. She, uh, she runs the Brooklyn Wellness Center. And uh, she's an entrepreneur type. And she went to a conference and she called me from Tennessee. And she says, I'm in this room with, you know, millionaires. And, you know, they're all entrepreneurs. And I'm, what am I doing here? And I said, girl, you better get out of that hotel room and you go right back in that ballroom. Because let me tell you something. You belong in every room that you're in. Everyone in there was you at one point. Those are the people you need to be around right now so that you can learn from. They yeah. were you. You mm-hmm. walk back in there. You yeah. belong in every room that you that you walk into. Yeah. And so that's what I take with myself. I'm like, I belong here. So I, if, I, if I feel like I belong here, then it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And who cares what someone else thinks? Most of the time, I haven't really had much resistance because I feel like when I show up at some, you know, listen, you do it responsibly. I'm not showing up at places that I feel like, you know, there's places you know you feel like, I don't really belong here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I'm talking like, you know, if I'm Puerto Rican and I'm Latin, right? I'm Latin and I'm a female. I belong in a female Puerto Rican organization, don't I? <laughs> yes, right? I mean, do. hello. Yes, yes. <laughs> so absolutely. I'm going to show up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Own the space that you're in, own the skin that you're mm-hmm. in, and have the confianza to mm-hmm. like walk into these spaces and own the room. Love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Audrey, tell the people where they can find you. Uh, well, you can find me on Fox 5 in New York, right? Uh, you can also stream it. We're at fox5ny.com. Social media platforms, it's all Audrey Puente, one word. All of them except for TikTok. Someone beat me. Someone so, beat you and got your name? Yeah, so I'm the Audrey Puente on TikTok. <laughs> I, I, I'm not into the the. I know people need to do it, but I, whenever a platform comes out, I always jump on it right away, whether I'm going to do it or not, just mm-hmm. to get my name, because there are other Audrey Puentes. Yeah. Not this Audrey Puente. Right, right. Not the there are, Audrey there are other Puente, people who have the same name as right, me. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's funny is that I follow all of them, and like we follow each other. <laughs> like, I love important. that. Yeah. The it's Audrey funny. Puente crew. Yes. <laughs> I want. I one day want to have a re- like a meetup with all of us. Yes, <laughs> like there's I love one. That. There's one in Texas. There's one in Alaska. I mean, wow. Like, yeah, like I love it. Yeah, they're all over. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on Banking Cultura. Thank I really you for inviting me. You being here, sharing your thought leadership, coming through with your energy. Mm-hmm. It is truly an honor and just. Um, 
Yeah, I I'll see you on the Emmy stage, girl. Yeah, wow. Well, <laughs> Absolutely. I look forward. I look forward. You bring the Emmy to lunch. We'll have a lunch with the Emmy. Right. We'll bring our Emmys to lunch. Yes. Emmys and tea and lunch. Yes. I love that. We'll bring them out on a date. (laughs) All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you on the next episode. Mi gente, did you enjoy this episode? Are you loving Banking on Cultura? Make sure to subscribe and follow us. Our goal is to grow this community so that we can all embrace our Latinidad secure the big bag, and never question our cultura ever again. Please also take a moment to leave us a review. I love reading your reviews. Let me know what you are thinking, what guests we should have on, and if there are any topics you would like me to cover. I appreciate you so much for being here. Te amo mucho, and I'll check you out in the next episode.